afternoon, everyone. Um, can I also just thank you all for coming? Um, I, um, it's very nice to have uh, a, a seminar of this kind with so many distinguished speakers and uh, old friends, and thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking um, on which measure of money matters to macroeconomic outcomes. Um, some of you will know my views on this, and uh, that we've held for a very long time, that it's only broad money that matters, and um, narrow money isn't worth looking at. Um, and um, so in a sense, I'm probably just sort of, have I got the cooker or can you just, thank you. Um, now this debate is, uh, irritates our people. I think it's like, uh, there's, uh, there's Anthony Harris, who used to be on the Financial Times, but not with us anymore, but he, he said that the debate between um, narrow money and broad money was um, like um, Jonathan Swift what the best way to open egg is at the big end or little end, and um, some people regard it as, on the contrary to me, this is one of the fundamental debates, and um, it's, I'm afraid, been one of the reasons why um, this whole monetarism has not succeeded, if you wish. And, um, now, I've, in this presentation, I start off uh, with, um, with Friedman, um, and I quote something that he wrote, that he said in 1959 and appeared in a book in 1960. Um, there are skeptics here, of whom Duncan Reagan is one, and there are others. Um, what he said in this book, this book was that, yes, the key to macro stability is stable growth and quantity of money. And if we want to defeat inflation, it should be at a low enough rate. So he said um, money growth should be 4% or so. And uh, he said that it should be 4 or 5% because he would expect over time, he specified very clearly it should be broad money. Uh, he expected over time that broad money would rise about 1% of GDP faster than national income in the USA. Well, um, let's just look through this. Um, okay, he says, there are changes in velocity, but in the long run they're all, the movements in money and national income are much larger. Um, we need to allow in these exercises for a change in velocity, uh, perhaps because of something structural happening in the economy, and uh, okay, fair enough. all the same. Steady growth of money should be associated with certainly steady growth of normal GDP. Um, he, as I said, this album is this, this book, 1960, based on lectures in 1959. It was in terms, without any doubt, um, of broad money. And he says, our research, the academic research, had kind of done short, so it wasn't very well spelled out. And it was all time deposits included in the measure of money. Um, this is all the stuff that uh, gets mocked. Um, but the concept of money just recommended a currency plus all commercial bank deposits just required a rate of growth of slightly over 4% per year on average over the past 90 years. 3% uh, so of our growth and output, 1% of our for, for the sector to decrease the velocity, and that would then be the more stable prices and macroeconomic stability. Well, and by the way, I really wasn't, I just went straight to M3 as can still be measured by the way of the USA. I got it straight to the data and worked it out, looking back, 1960 to 2018. The answer was that a broad money rose by 7.4%, normal GDP rose by 6.5%, etc. I didn't, I didn't undermine the data or anything, else, anything of that sort, that's just what happened. Now, you then, um, look a little bit further at this. There's obviously, between 1960 and curiously quite recently, a lot of volatility in the growth rate of M3. And by the way, there is a clear relationship between that volatility in the business cycle, clear relationship between decades of high money growth and inflation and low money growth and low inflation. And then you have this strange business that in the last seven years, when money has been mocked and derided and the rest of it, Somehow or another, the Federal Reserve has more or less complied with Friedman's rule. 
This is, I think, pure serendipity, but that's what's happened. All right, so it's roughly got 4% or so on average growth rate of money. And uh, so what's happened to the economy? In fact, that seven-year period, um, had there been lower money growth of the early 1990s, but the, the last seven years has the most stable growth of money of any seven-year period in that uh, 58 years. It has the lowest inflation and the most stable growth of non-GDP. Now look, you know, I'm not a fool. These numbers just come out. I didn't do any, any hard work to get there. Um, now, so why, let's just try and understand you know, where all these quarrels and arguments begin. And I think they really begin and go back to, in a way, the race of the subject. Um, the problem, the realization that there's something called money that's different from goods is certainly very clear, um, you know, even in classical times. The banking system started to come through in early medieval Europe. And the problem of monetary, problems of monetary theory then start up really in the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries with the influx of, of gold and silver from the New World from through Spain. The question always was, what is the effect of an increase in the quantity of money on the economy and the price level? Uh, I've got enough, there's an awful lot one can say uh, about uh, um, the different contributions and so on. Um, you know, these people are quite stupid. I mean, the notion that there's all these decades and centuries of data and writings and so on, and somehow, you know, as is implied sometimes by uh, Dr. Leadham and others, that somehow we're all bought barley. I'm sorry, there's a reason for what we're talking about. Good. Um, and um, the, anyway, by the time you've got the, the, the debate between the banking school and the currency school in the early 19th century and mid 19th century England was very much about this question of which measure of money is most important to macroeconomic outcomes, as put it in modern terms. <coughs> And banking school thinking in terms of all they used to credit, but they really meant um, bank deposits, bills, and exchange. <coughs> Against the currency school that tended to prefer narrow money. Anyway, by the, by the late 1950s, early 1960s, there was always huge literature and background and so on. The stuff had started to be put into quite complex economic theory. And this is really when um, Chicago and Friedman start to become important. I don't think there's much dispute that it was in America in the late 50s that the debate started to get, the modern debates really, started, really began. Um, and Chicago was important. Um, in Britain, effectively, um, in Cambridge, there was a huge quarrel between Dennis Robertson and people who called themselves Keynesians. Harrod and what Harrod's jobs, but uh, Caldor in particular and others. And Caldor and the Keynesians wanted to dismiss monetary economics and money because they thought that the future lay in, frankly, in socialism, planning, and the rest of it. Um, and Caldor and others persuaded the 1959 Rabbit Rabbit Committee that much of monetary economics was, was nonsense. Anyway, in America, by contrast, there was really these very important debates. And I think I want to, in the next few minutes, very quickly highlight what to me was the probably the crucial intellectual debate, which is really between, perhaps I'm saying something that goes too far, but it was really between um, Friedman and, and Patinkin. Um, Friedman was very empirical. And so he and Anna Schwartz followed on some work by Chapman, Park Waterton, and others. Um, and they produced these long runs of American data, of data in America about money growth and on the GDP and prices and book output and rest of it. Um, and um, on the basis of this work, Friedman decided that it was broad money that was the best measure. He said this in all of his major monetary documents. Uh, so it's in 
Part of the ministry, it's in Monetary Trends, 1952, it's in the 1960 little page I showed you. Um, whereas there was a chap called Patinkin, they knew each other, they were friends, at least they were initially friends. Uh, and uh, Patinkin wrote, so Friedman's very empirical, just by an actually top notch economic theoretician and so on. And Patinkin wrote the definitive work about how uh, money affects the economy in answering this question, what is the effect of an increase in the quantity of money on the economy? Uh, in, this, in a book called Money, Interest and Prices. It's a very hard book. Um, first edition, 1956. Uh, second edition, 1965. It, but having said it's a very hard book, you know, this, this is really real brain power being applied to this very old question. This is the answer. Well, is it? And what I want to do now is to run through a, an argument that Patinkin managed to persuade himself at that time could allow him to ignore the banking system and broad money. And this argument, I just keep on hearing time and time again. What it's, the way it runs is as follows. Um, banking systems, but assets and liabilities, when um, the assets of the banking system rise, because, for example, there's a new loan to the private sector, and there's offsetting deposit on the self balance sheet, there is no effect on the net wealth of the private sector, because the two sides of the balance sheet are the same, Therefore, this doesn't matter to the economy. All right. So then there's a chap called Farmer. Uh, particularly never got the Nobel Prize. Farmer is still alive and has got it. Uh, he proposed in an article in 1980, Banking a Theory of Finance, that commercial banks' behavior had no special significance to the economy's general equilibrium. For this, Patinkin's reason, basically. It's more complicated than this, a few more words and things. He's basically backing Patinkin up. So I call this, this is an argument you can basically just ignore broad money altogether. So you know, the Bank of England, uh, Treasury, they'll, they'll do stupid things in the 1960s where I about it because it didn't matter. And um, this, this idea just rolls on and on. They didn't really test it. There was a test by a chap called Tom Meyer, who initially was a skeptic about monetarism, then became a convert. Um, and he found out that if you um, look at the effect of change in monetary base, this is the bit of the, of the, of the story that does matter, because the commercial bank's balance sheet cancels out, the central bank doesn't, so the base is important to, but then um, the, hold on my God, Probably got but no hardly any time at all. Yeah, that's all right. I've got no, not really, but I'm not at all getting what I really wanted to, to say. Never mind. Um, the, the effect of um, uh, an increase in the base does match the economy, but Tom I showed that it didn't, it wasn't big enough. Anyway, the effect of this, this, this sort of puzzle conundrum just rolled on and on, and it still is around today. Um, and I want just to mention some places in which um, it's, uh, even today we hear it in prominence matter, and what's important to look at um, is the, uh, um, you hear it at the moment, for example, in, we can forget about broad money, and um, we need to look at what's happening to the base because that's going to affect lending at some point and then that can affect the economy. So we have all of these forecasts of surging inflation. This is about, what, eight, nine, ten years ago now, because of the increase in the monetary base, which hadn't turned out right. It's been low growth broad money, and um, okay. I'm not going to have time to get to my really important points, but. Um, the two key points in explaining why broad money really matters are as follows. Broad money consists of all, some money balances which are inside uh, um, M1 and others that are not. 
that are inside any measure of narrow money you can think about, and some that are not. The relative, uh, uh, the amount of, of uh, narrow money balances people want to hold will depend partly, mostly, on the relative attractions of those two different types of money balance. There can be, they usually are, in terms of understanding how M1 moves, there can be changes in the rate of interest on non-money, non-M1 balances against M1 balances that cause M1 to go up and down. And these changes in M1 have no bearing on the economy. The same argument cannot apply to broad money because it's all inclusive. So the argument that actually sets out how the real balance effect works, and I'm sorry I haven't got time to go through it all, I can't brush this thing with too much in it. Um, the, the, the way that the real balance effect works depends on this idea of there can be too much money or too little money that, that, that agents hold, and then they take decisions which cause income, spending, and so on to change. That only applies to an all-inclusive measure of money. That, that, that's the key to understanding why broad money always matters. Friedman, Friedman's discrediting in the profession, as it were, was really in the early 80s when he used, I think, one of these newsweek articles to forecast on the basis of M1 that inflation was going to accelerate in the mid 1980s. And he was completely wrong. And um, he then got more careful about using M1 um, and returned in the end to broad money. But he made that mistake, and that was one of the key reasons for discrediting monetarism in the USA, because he made this very categorical forecast of rising inflation. It didn't happen. The second argument for the importance of broad money is that, well, to me at least, some of the most important developments in monetary theory in the 20th century were the need to incorporate money in portfolios to explain why people companies, institutions held money rather than non-money assets. As Keynes said, money doesn't pay any interest. Most money balances don't, or pay no rate of interest. So why do does anybody that is an outside of living asylum ever hold any money when they can have their money in assets instead, yielding a rate of return? What that implies is it's very important that any, any theory uh, of money holding and any application of that theory to reality must be of aggregate that is in portfolios, is, can compete with uh, 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 um, non-money assets in portfolios, and that only makes sense with an all-inclusive measure of money. I think I'll come to an end now. I'm more or less exhausted my time. Um, there's an awful lot more to say. Um, this debate rolls on, but much of the trouble that's happened in the very recent past with money in America, I'll just have, if I can, just have a very quick, I'll get through all of this. I'm afraid there's an awful lot to say. And I'm going to show you what's happened to, to M2 in the USA, M1 and M2 in the last. This is. Um, there was a, a review in the Journal of Economic Literature um, a few years ago, um, I think it was 2012. There are 21 books on the Great Recession. Not discussion of 21 books, not a single mention of, of money aggregate. This is even though Bernanke had said that, that money was important in the Great Depression. Let's look at M1 and M2 in the USA in the the, the dotted lines define the period of the Great Recession as defined by the NDER. You get no warning from either M1 or M2 of anything going wrong. You get the highest growth rate of M1 right in the middle of the recession. M2 is scarcely any better. And is, is it very surprising that you'd actually get complete contempt for money, aggregates, and so on in the Great Recession? The surges in M1 and M2 were the consequence of a slashing of interest rates which caused, within broad money, a movement of money balances from non-M1 balances to M1 balances, and something similar to M2. 
Not quite so extreme. These measures are just useless. Let's look at N3. Now look, you still might be working out even though it's not fair to start publishing it. <coughs> it's not perfect. There's a lot of things wrong, but at least you can have a discussion. But this question, which you know, many economists think is a sideshow and is not terribly important, is absolutely fundamental to understanding why our prison got just disillusionment, dismissed, all the rest of it. The direct measure of money and economic 